So this video is going to be about men's rare. Hopefully you've watched the previous video and you've seen all about actors rares. If you haven't and you don't know what actors rares is, this video isn't going to make any sense to you whatsoever. So you need to go back and have a watch of that one. But assuming you have seen that one, I want you to think about the meaning of actors rares being the guilty act part. And I want you to think, well, if actors may Reyes means guilty act, what does mens rea mean? So mens rea, hopefully you will have figured out, is Latin again. And it means the guilty mind. It's the mental element. What is required to be going on in your head when you committed the crime? It's usually required in conjunction with actus reus to form the basis of a crime. And for now, all we're going to say is you don't require mens rea with strict liability crimes. We will come back in a later video and look at exactly what strict liability is. So it will all come together then. So mens rea is the mental element and it's to do with whether you meant to do what you actually did. It's not to do with motive. Um, sometimes they are linked, but we aren't concerned with the motive behind a crime. We're just interested in, did they mean to do it? Did they see the outcome was virtually certain? Or did they just see a risk and take it anyway? So what we're going to do is have a look at the different levels of mens rea as illustrated by some case law. But as always, when you are using cases, you need to be looking at the ratio decidendi, which hopefully you remember means the legal reason for the decision. What we're not interested in so much is telling the story behind the case. Sometimes the story is helpful for illustrating the point. Certainly the facts of the case, the story behind exactly what happened will help you to remember them. But remember, it's not the he said, she said bit that we're so interested in. It's what the judge said the legal point was based on those facts. So there are three different levels of mens rea that we need to look at in my book. Different people will say there are two levels and one of them is split into two. I can't do that maths. As far as I'm concerned, there are three levels. We start off looking at intention, first of all, direct intention. And this is where it is the person's aim or purpose to bring about the prohibited consequence. In other words, they got what they wanted. The next level down is oblique intention. Sometimes this is known as indirect intent. Um, don't mind which one you use, one or the other, and stick with one, I would. So oblique intent is where it's not the defendant's aim or purpose, but the outcome is virtually certain and the defendant knew this. And the lowest level of mens rea that we need to look at, at the moment is recklessness. This is where your defendant sees a risk and took it anyway. So some people find it a little bit tricky to work out the different levels of intention, especially working out the difference between oblique intent and recklessness. So what I like to do is to assign percentages of likelihood. This is something that I've come up with. It's, it's not something that people do in court, but I think it certainly makes it a little easier to understand. So these percentages are rough and ready, fairly arbitrary. They're nothing to stick with but they certainly illustrate the point so direct intent is 100 percent because the defendant got what they wanted so the likelihood of it happening was 100 percent because it did happen oblique intent is 95 percent because it's not what they wanted but it was virtually certain 95 percent likely to happen and it did end up happening Recklessness is not virtually certain. The outcome is not virtually certain. The likelihood of it happening is somewhere around 50-50. Um, it's not what they wanted. It was a possibility. They saw that there was a risk and they decided to take it anyway. 
So we need to think about where this actually comes into play. Where does this become relevant? And we have to look at a concept called culpability or blameworthiness. Because the higher your level of intention, the higher your sentence is likely to be. So let's have an example of slapping somebody. It might be that you had direct intent to slap your friend. You were angry at them, so you slapped them. It was 100% likely to happen and you got what you wanted. But let's say, for example, you were waving your arms around. You saw your friend was there and that you were getting very close to them. You didn't actually mean to touch them, but you were so close to them and you were being so silly that it was virtually certain to happen. Now, that would be oblique intent. Let's take the same example, but you're a little bit further away this time. You're waving your arms around. You see that you could collide with them and that your hand could hit their face, but you decide to continue going along with it. Now, the person in the first scenario who intended, they got what they wanted, it was their aim or purpose to slap their friend, is going to get a higher sentence than the person who, despite having the same actus reus, slapping their friend, they didn't actually mean to, it, they saw that there was a risk, they took it anyway by waving their arms around. So the first person would get a higher sentence than the second person. So, Let's have a look and see how these work in some case examples. The first case that I want to show you with this nifty little drawing is the case of R and Mohan, which illustrates direct intent. And as you can see, we have the car driving at the police officer and the police officer is forced to jump out of the way. So the case of Mohan, as we said, illustrates direct intent. As you saw in the picture, the defendant drove at the police officer who had to jump out of the way. And Lord Justice James said direct intention was a state of affairs which the defendant decides to bring about and which he has a reasonable prospect of being able to bring about by his own act. So simply put, it's the defendant's aim or purpose to bring about the result that he wanted. Direct intent. The quote from Lord Justice James is a bit wordy. If you can include at least some part of that in your answers, examiners absolutely love that and it will score you some real points. So let's move on now to look at the case of R and Woolin. Again, I made these illustrations myself and actually... What you see in the picture is exactly what happened. So the case of Aaron Woolin illustrates oblique intent. The defendant, who was a man, not a woman, I uh, couldn't find a picture of a man, lost his temper and threw his three month old son at the pram. The child missed the pram and hit the wall and the child died. The defendant was convicted of murder and appealed his conviction based on the fact that it wasn't his intention to kill the child. And his appeal was unsuccessful because the outcome of his actions throwing the child was virtually certain. And most importantly, he knew this. So oblique intent, you must ensure that you get both parts. It's not only virtually certain, but the defendant knew this. And finally, we have the case of R and Cunningham. Now, this one's a little bit more cryptic. Um, what you have on the right hand side is a gas meter. You may or may not have seen one of these. There aren't so many people with them anymore. What you do is you put your money in the top slot and um, gas is fed to your home. So if you need to use the hob to cook on, if you need to put the heating on, you have to put money in the machine, first of all. I know more modern times you tend to either go to the shop and buy a card or you pay for it on direct debit. But as you can see at the bottom, there is a drawer which pulls out, which is where the money is collected. Now, the key that you see in it, obviously, you wouldn't have one of those because what would be to stop you just taking the money out and putting it back in? 
um, somebody would come along occasionally and collect the money out. You can probably see what happened here. So in the case of Aaron Cunningham, the defendant broke into the gas meter in order to steal the money. He didn't disconnect the gas and it leaked, gassing the occupants of the property next door. It wasn't his aim or purpose to gas the people next door. It wasn't even virtually certain. But in this case, the defendant saw a risk that this could happen and took it anyway. So he was reckless. So that is mens rea. What I'd like you to do now is using all the information that you've learned from today's session, I'd like you to create a revision card which would help you to answer the following question. Explain with cases the meaning of the term mens rea. That's a seven mark question. So if you're not sure, go back through the previous slides and mop up anything that you're, you haven't got already and then come back and complete that question.